Thanks for checking out this movie review video. Uh, did one of these uh, the last time was The Return of the Living Dead, and that was for Uncle Pete, subscriber Uncle Pete. This one's not actually for any subscriber. Nobody put anything on there that they really wanted or, and as a subscriber. Uh, but just to remind you all, if you have a movie you really would like me to review, it doesn't have to be horror, but if I'm just picking, I'm going to do horror. But you can throw something else out there. I like all genres. So just comment down there, and you have to be a subscriber. So just go ahead and hit the subscribe up there. Even if you're not going to suggest a movie, please hit the subscribe. Helps out a lot for me. It takes you like one second. Painless. Uh, anyway, so this is one I just wanted to do because it's a movie I've been wanting to rewatch. And it is a film called The Loved Ones. This is an Australian film from 2009. I have my notes here. Uh, just going to go over these. So, 2009 film, the first time I saw it, I remember being pretty impressed with it because I didn't know a whole lot going into it, uh, except what's on the cover of the, at that time, DVD. Um, it does have a Blu-ray Blu release at this point, I do believe, so... Um, <clears throat> written and directed by Sean Byrne. This guy also did the film Devil's Candy, which is, uh, I don't know if it still is, but at least was on Netflix. So check right now and see if it's on there. I haven't seen it. I've actually heard really good things about Devil's Candy. So I have been meaning to check it out, especially because this guy did The Loved Ones. I enjoy The Loved Ones. So, yeah. Um, the budget for this film was actually $4 million in Australia. I mean, obviously it's converted. Um, Australian box office, this film made $254,170, so obviously it lost big time. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that this was a bad film, though, or that it's not going to gather any sort of following, because as we all know, there are films all the time that bomb, but then get a cult following, you know, not long after they come out of theaters, but what's more common is many years after they come out of theaters, and people kind of had to have time to, uh, watch it, get get the word out there, a lot of word of mouth goes on. So then you start to get the cult followings going on then. Uh, this one, I know a lot of people within the horror community, when you bring this film up, if they've seen it, are like, oh man, I really love the loved ones. So I haven't heard anyone who's like, oh, I saw that and I didn't like it. So this one's one of those films that didn't do well in the box office, but was re has really picked up steam since. So originally this film, when it was sent to the rating, sent to the rating board in Australia, was going to be given an R18+, plus, which I guess is their kind of like R rating, 18 and over. It was going to get an R18+, plus, but it ended up being lowered to an MA15+, plus rating, and that was because of an appeal that Sean Byrne and the others on the film made to, the, to that review board, and they ended up adding some kind of comedic stuff to the film. And for that reason, the board said, okay, fine, you can get a lower rating on it because they then felt like the comedic stuff kind of took a lot of the, what did they say? It said it, it mitigated aspects of the violence, basically, that it was a sadistic film. And when you put that kind of comedic stuff in, it lightens it a little bit. It doesn't make it as intense as sadistic, which I agree with. And honestly, I really do like the kind of comedic stuff because it, it feels like it gives you a break from the intensity, because it is an intense film. Um, this film actually, like I was saying, you know, cult following, uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it is number 37 on the Rotten Tomatoes all-time top-rated horror movie list. So they have a top 100, and it is number 37, the loved ones. So it speaks to how good it is, or at least how good people think it is, uh, myself included. I do enjoy it. So, um, for me, oh, spoilers, just so you know, uh, before I go any further, there will be spoilers for this film. If you haven't seen it, stop, go watch it, come back. Anyway, uh, what I love about this film is how the main character of Brent, um, goes through so much. You know, the beginning of the film is him losing his father in a car accident. A car accident that you find out later was indirectly caused by Lola, the main villain of the film. And that's also interesting because, because not only is it about his emotional pain versus his physical pain, but it's also about the, the fact that Lola causes all of it. You know, he doesn't understand that in the beginning, like his father's dead because of what Lola was doing, but he ends up understanding that later. And that kind of like spurs him further even more for revenge. 
And one of the really interesting things, too, about the emotional versus the physical pain in this film is that it really seems like, at least the way Brent's character was written and acted, that when it comes to the emotional pain, he can't get over it. And it kind of feels like he's willing to give up and he's going to give up. And he kind of, like, wants to die because he's so apathetic about life. And that's kind of how he goes into his encounter with Lola is he's resilient but he's also kind of not so much fighting for himself. It's more like resigned to nothingness in a sense. You know, he's kind of nihilistic at that point. But when he is then dealt this physical pain, it's it becomes more of a motivator for him to want to live. And then spurred on even further when he basically finds out that it's because of what Lola's been doing that that guy was out on the road, he swerved and hit a tree and his, you know, father ended up dying. So... That's where he really gets the fight in him and is like, I'm not going down. And that's where he gets this renewed feeling of, I actually want to live. So it kind of turns everything around for him. But I found it really interesting how it was like the emotional pain was way too much to handle, but the physical pain was not. And I kind of like that dichotomy within this film. So just saying. Um, What is made work? Okay, I'm sorry if you end up hearing my cat in the background. She's... You know, if she's not being paid attention to, she goes crazy. But anyway, so um, one of the things that makes what happens with Brent even worse and makes Lola look even worse is the fact that in the beginning, Brent is very much coming to her aid in a sense. He's shielding her really from be- from ridicule from people in um, in the school that they're that they're going to. So it kind of paints Brent really quickly as a decent person and kind of like feeling for her and looking out for her feelings. So he does reject her, but it's like a very light rejection and it's not mean and he then shields her and she knows this. So it makes it even worse later when she's like totally basically killing him. Um, I mean, she it's slowly, but, you know, inflicting all this pain. So it just makes her much worse and makes him seem even more sympathetic uh, within the film, so I like that aspect of it. Um, I think the the soundtrack in the beginning really hits the high school teenage feel. It was very like light. It's a lot of the type, well, mixed with some heavy metal, but it kind of hit everything that makes you think like, oh, teen music. You know, it kind of helps set the mood of they're in high school. Um, so I talk about the that. Um, so Lola and her father, obviously, their relationship is super messed up. Um, So in many ways, she's daddy's girl. She's daddy's girl because he will do anything for her. But she's daddy's girl in like a sexual way too, which is a whole nother aspect to this film that is just like totally creepy and totally nasty. But at the same time, uh, Sean Byrne did a really good job in his directing of this, of kind of, well, writing as well, making it, making you see the connection between these two characters, between Lola and her father. And it... Like, at moments, you're like, oh, it's kind of sweet in this moment, but it's also terrible and nasty and just awful. I don't know. It's so weird. And I think a lot of that has to do with musical choices, especially the part where she's dancing and she asks her father to dance and she's kind of like, oh, you know, I've been looking for my prince, but it's always been you. It's always been you. Like, the mu- that nice musical backdrop makes you feel like a nicer emotion than what you really should be feeling there. And I like that because it, you know, it says to me, it's an awesome film. It's really well done. When you can make me feel something I either normally wouldn't or really don't want to. And in those case, in those cases, well, in that case of that film, you don't want to feel that you don't want to be like, Oh, this is kind of a sweet moment because you are like that for a split second. And then you're just like, Oh, no, no, this is not a sweet moment. This is awful in so many ways. It's terrible. And then you realize it's this really nice music that's making it emotional. Really good use of music, Sean Byrne. Really great job on that. So, um, yeah. Uh, next thing. Uh, this film actually ended up coming out towards the end of the torture porn um I guess, movement at that point. You know, the, I think the the fifth Saw film had just come out at this point. Obviously, they went to seven, and then they did Jig, Jigsaw on top of that, so eight total of those. Uh, but this was towards the end of the torture porn. So 
That being said, people were getting a little bit tired of it, which is maybe part of the reason it didn't do all that well in the box office. But I think it's still fit for the time because if you're going to do something in the same vein as what's been going on, you need to do something different. You need to bring something fresh to it. And I think this film really brought something fresh to the whole torture porn thing. Um, it No one had been doing it from a high school dance aspect and uh, or point of view. And it's totally original. It was really interesting. And, you know, not only was it an original idea, but it was really executed extremely well. And on that note, the cinematography was outstanding. The film looked so good. And the directing, a lot of the shot choices, a lot of the, you know, movements and how they made the, the characters interact with each other were really spot on and just kind of moved everything forward very, very well, in my opinion. So, because it was so different, it kind of stood out within the torture porn subgenre, which is good. Um, great job with acting. The pacing was really awesome in this film. I think it was perfect. It didn't seem like it was too long. It didn't seem like it was too short. It was pretty much right on. It really kept the intensity kind of the whole time. You really didn't know when um, Lola or her father were going to do something. You know, they, they were on the edge of doing the next thing kind of all the time. And I think partially a lot of the more silent portions of the soundtrack really helped with that. It made you kind of feel more tense and like, uh, what's coming next? But also kind of the pacing of how they meted out um, when the terrible things were done to Brent were. So all those things came together and made it, you know, move very well and keep the tension up. Um... The muffled screaming, though, the muffled screaming is very effective in this film because it's so unnerving and it's just so scary in a sense. You know, he has his vocal cords just totally messed up from that kind of, you know, drain cleaner and the other people who were, you know, being kept there. And when you just hear that kind of like ah, noise, I can't do it. But, you know, if you've seen the film, you know, hearing that noise is so unnerving and it's you're just it just makes you like, oh, it's tough. So it was a very effective noise to use for this film. I liked it. Um, obviously, we talked about the fact, you know, this incest territory thing is just, like, so messed up. But it's not just about the relationship of, oh, it's his daughter, and it's, you know, he'd do anything for her, plus there's the sexual thing going on. But it's also the aspect of he's teaching her to be him. You know, obviously, they're doing a lot of the same stuff. He's even walking her through, like, doing the hole in the forehead and, you know, with a lot of detail, as you can see, you know, he's just like, oh, you do it this way, you don't go in too far, you gotta make the hole big enough, you know, all these things. So he's also trying to turn her into him. Chloe, psst, please stop, sorry. Um, so she's trying, he's trying to turn her into him. And it's just, it's terrible, it's sickening, really. Like, this is what happens when terrible parents, the worst rate, the, the worst kid rearing you could do. Um, uh, the pit of the people when it's revealed is kind of, I'm not going to say it's, it's not like a left turn. What I guess what I want to say is it's a pretty big surprise. It's a really crazy reveal because you don't really see that coming. Like, you know that she's done stuff with other guys and you, but you don't think that they're still around. You assume that they've been killed and buried, ditched somewhere. But the fact that there's that reveal where you're like, they're being kept in like this feral state makes everything even worse. It's just like this film with with the actions of the father and Lola just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And it just ratchets up the what's at stake here because it's not just about Brent at this point. It's about, you know, if Brent doesn't stop this, then it's going to keep going on. There will be another and then another and another and another. And as she gets older, she becomes more capable too. Terrible, but good for, you know, interest in the film. Um... This answers the question, what happens when you turn someone down who is a psychopath, a, a violent psychopath? And I think that's probably where Sean Burns started with, with his idea. The question that popped into his head when he wanted to start writing this film um, seems like it was a logical start for it. And I just thought that was funny. Um, oh, and in the end of the film, I'm almost done with this. In the end of the film, it's such an amazing shot, like that really long shot of the car 
after Lola's all messed up and she was hit by the car uh, by that Brent was driving, and she's like off screen, and then she comes crawling onto screen with a knife, like helping herself like crawl on the asphalt and coming for the car, basically. It just how far back that that shot was set just makes it look so good. And I don't know how anyone would come up with that idea, but it was really awesome. It looked really cool. And it, it, it's just like this kind of creeping dread type moment. And I think it played extremely well and all for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, honestly, as you could tell, I, I quite enjoy this film. I think it's definitely worth seeing. If you watched this and listened to me and you haven't seen the film, I wouldn't say it's totally ruined because you can't convey the intensity through through a movie review. You can't convey what the shots are like. You know, you have to really experience that stuff. And this film looks so good. They did such a good job. The sound, the acting, the writing, directing, cinematography, just it's all really well done. Now, that said, I don't think it's the most amazing film. So I do a rating scale on this uh, out of five stars, and you can do halves. I would put this at a very solid three and a half. I thought about giving it a four, so if I was doing quarters, I would probably do three and three quarters, but I'm not, so I, I feel like more it's it's on the three and a half range. But good film, definitely recommend people seeing it. Uh, one thing that was recommended and asked for uh, by subscriber Uncle Pete for the last review that I did, he's, he said, hey, at the end, could you give some recommendations? So with these reviews, I want to just give one recommendation and kind of say, if you like this film, see this. So... If you enjoyed The Loved Ones and you could handle all the intensity, all the violence, all the torture involved with it, I would say try to watch the French extreme film Martyrs. Do not see the American remake. I haven't seen it. I've heard it's not good, though. See the original French extreme film Martyrs. Now... That is even further with the violence and the brutality than what The Loved One is, is so just know that going into it. Uh, when I first saw that film, I was kind of like, this is really over-the-top brutal, and I really hope there's a point to all this. Trust me, there is actually a point to all of it. So, Pascal Laguier did that film. He did an outstanding job, but it's super dark. It's super brutal, so just know that going into it. But that is my recommendation based off of this. If you like The Loved Ones, check out Martyrs. Um, I guess I could do a recommendation of if you didn't like The Loved Ones, what, sh what should you see? Um, I would have to go ahead and say if you didn't like The Loved Ones, see something a little bit more on the light side. One of my favorite horror comedies is Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Go check out that. It's got horror to it. It's got gore to it. But it's super light and there's a lot of good comedy Tyler Labine, Alan Tudyk in there are amazingly funny, and it's really well put together. So, hey, if you like The Loved Ones, you could check that out, too. That's a really good film for horror comedy. Anyway, thank you, everyone, for checking this out. Please, once again, subscribe if you can. Then put a recommendation for a movie for me to review down there. I will see if I can get on that. And if you can give me some likes, just comments in general. We can talk film. But thank you so much for checking this out. Spread the word. And until next time, keep it brutal.